Uh, Tusen tak. Uh, hi. <laughs> and uh, that is the end of my uh, Danish capability. So um, it's really great to be back in Denmark, actually. I spent uh, two years doing research with Jens Christian in uh, Aarhus and really enjoyed that. So it's fantastic to be back and I really appreciated the invitation from Maunus. When I got the invitation, I was writing uh, a book chapter trying to summarize some of the work I've been doing in Britain and how we might rewild Britain. And I was trying to think about how to describe what the book chapter covered because it was getting far too long and, and generally get, and lots of people have input and different ideas about what rewilding is. So we started off with a bit of theory and then I've been working a little bit on uh, wolf population modelings and how virtual uh, rewilding can, can try and uh, inform us about how things might work in reality. And I've also done some experimental rewilding with some wild boar up in the Scottish Highlands. So I'm going to try and tell you about uh, as much of that as I can over the next 15, 20 minutes or so. Okay, so as I'm sure most of you are aware, the initial concept of rewilding was built around large core areas, connectivity between them, and keystone species. And uh, Sue and Noss uh, particularly said large predators. Uh, I think that was mainly in the context of, uh, of where they were talking about, which is uh, in, in North America. And I think the keystone species element is particularly interesting for rewilding. And I also think it's, it's the one that requires a bit more discussion and also brings uh, the other two into context, i.e. what is large? Large is a difficult concept, large according to what? And I think it's in the context of the species and the communities you're trying to restore or rewild that the, the importance of large uh, becomes relevant. Instead of using keystone species, I tend to talk about community reassembly uh, to restore ecosystem function. This is to restore the natural processes that drive how the, the dynamics of an ecosystem. And I fear sometimes when talking about keystone species, people get particularly excited by their species or species they work on or species they're particularly uh, keen, to, keen to see back. At the same time, I think people get very worried about the implications of some species from a, from a social point of view. And I put the wolf up here partly because it's a species I'm interested in, but also generates such uh, cr a crazy set of emotions from uh, re really uh, representing the wild to, uh, to, to a considerable amount of fear. Uh, and I think what's really important about it from an ecological perspective, and I think this is where rewilding should start, is we're not so worried about putting the wolf back in. The wolf's not doing too badly as a species. It's, it's probably not our major priority in terms of rare, rare species. But it's the interactions that the wolf has with the rest of the system that's important. And what's important then is to think what species are currently in the system. Because if you put the wolf back, it makes a big difference <coughs> depending on what, what is already there and present. If you put the wolf into Yellowstone, you've got a fairly intact system over there. If you put it into Scotland, you're poss possibly less so. And there's, there's different things uh, taking place. So it's in the context of that community that I think is important how we think about rewilding. Um, so yeah, so... In terms of what rewilding is then, I think community assembly rules is a, is a useful concept within ecology that we can think about how we might, might achieve certain things with rewilding. And the, and the idea of community assembly rules, if we look at the, at the, at the, middle, uh, the middle column, uh, we start off with a total species pool. This is all the species that exist on the planet. Uh, so we have quite a, quite a few to choose from. But if we're, we're trying to take that from that global perspective down to what species you find at a local site, your rewilding project site. So we start off with a, any of those species in the globe could potentially be at your local rewilding project, but we have some dispersal filtering. Species that are in South America currently are unlikely to get to Scotland anytime soon, depending on their dispersal abilities, uh, obviously. So that, that limits the species pool down a little bit in what's called the geographic species pool. <clears throat> Once you have your ge geographic species pool, the environmental conditions within that area then will will play an important role about what species can actually survive on your, your rewilding project site. And this is, again, important with rewilding because we tend to try and think about very long time scales. And what may have been present 100 or 1,000 years or more in the past is not necessarily the conditions uh, today. The species you actually lost in the past might have affected the, spe the, the, the environmental conditions you have currently, which is important to think about. And then you have, so that, that gives you a habitat species pool, so this might be your regional, this might be the whole of the Scottish Highlands, all the species that can occur there. If we then look at a landscape, uh, any, you know, your, your uh, probably finest, finest scale from a rewilding perspective, we then need to think about what species are currently in, in that landscape and how they interact with each other. This is like the inter, uh, uh, internal dynamics, ecosystem dynamics. So we have uh, 
depending on what predators you have in place and what you're, you're, whether your mutualists are there and whether you're being outcompeted by better competitors, there's a lot to consider within your, within your system, within your ecosystem dynamics. So that's kind of our, our natural process. We kind of consider humans to either be part or slightly separated from, from the system. We certainly change the dynamics of the way many of these ecosystems work. And we can do this at all levels. So the species, species extinction, if we completely remove them from the species pool, they cannot disperse anymore. They cannot uh, enter your, your system. Uh, and I think the famous one that we generally talk about rewilding, which Jens Christian's already touched upon, uh, or, or, or gone into quite a lot of detail, is, is the Pleistocene Lake, lake Quaternary extinction. That, that removed a, lo a large number of species uh, from your, your total species pool. Then you can talk about human dispersal barriers, and I often think about over the last 10,000 years, where would Asian elephants be today if they hadn't been getting smaller and smaller in range and they could have been expanding? They may, may, maybe, they, maybe they were at their limit, but it also could have been potentially much further if you think about where species have got to in the past over the last interglacial period. So we're, we're putting limits on dispersal, and uh, I, think, I think that's important to think about in terms of in, rather than thinking about where species are or where they've been his, historically, where they were in the future, where they would be in the future is, is an equally interesting question. Uh, obviously, we have big in impacts on how the environment works, and um, obviously climate change is going to have some s significant impacts as well. And I'd really better hurry up. Um, so I'm going to skip. But we can also, from a rewilding point of view, uh, that we can we then can then take actions against these. Actions. We can talk about tax on substitution, replacing species um, by uh, finding finding very similar functional species. So straight tusk tusk elephant is the Asian elephant going to do a similar role? Uh, we can talk about species reintroductions. Uh, and we can uh, restore uh, environmental conditions and features, and we can rewild the internal dynamics by looking about how we impact species numbers and try and remove that. And I think this looks uh, something a bit like this. So at the top slide, wow, I'm really going <laughs> to run over. Um, we, have, we have our natural ecosystem dynamics, and this is the way it all functions. We can remove species, we can change the environmental conditions, and we can remove it into a, a reduced stable state. And that's shown at the top. But equally, we can look at a sequence of reintroductions that may improve the environmental conditions and internal dynamics, which will allow more species to come. And we can try and move it from a, an impoverished uh, uh, ecosystem dynamics to a, to a, more, uh, to a richer system. So it's, I think what's really important is to look at what species or what to fill what functional guilds uh, and what sequence can we put them back in to restore all the, the dynamics we want to the system. So going on to Scotland in particular, um, I, I started with this slide because there's very little of this actually left in Scotland. Uh, we, we chopped down uh, quite, quite a large amount of forest. Uh, we also had some climate change re which reduced the forest cover. But right now we have maybe a semi-natural uh, forest or ancient woodland. We have about 1% maybe of what, what it was. And people talk about restoring particular habitats. But I, that, I think that's important in context to say we're very limited on woodland. But our actual aims for the ecosystem is one that's self-sustaining. We don't, we don't necessarily want, uh, it's, it's kind of the open-ended open conservation. We ideally want a system that creates the internal dynamics that supports all the systems over, over the landscape or regional scale. We want probably one that's higher biodiversity. I think rewilding is part of that and has, a, has an aim to look after the biodiversity. I think we'd be upset if we rewilded and found out we lost a lot of species. And, we, and humans are part of the system, undoubtedly, and we need to think about the ecosystem services that that's providing uh, and, and the people that are currently living in the system. So from the Scottish Highlands point of view, I think there are a number of processes we need to think about. Things like seed source, as I said, we've chopped down a lot of trees. Some species in particular have been heavily hit, and so maybe not part of the, of, of the species pool anymore. So we need to think about well, that. Need, if you lose your seed source, you're going to lose your seed dispersers. Uh, your germination niche, this is creating patches of bare ground for, for trees and other shrubs to get a chance to, to re-establish. Uh, uh, depends on how many large herbivores you have running around. Your predator herbivore plant interactions, we have no big predators left in Scotland, um, which means we have a high herbivore abundance and, and then our, any trees that do establish rapidly get uh, chewed up. And then the soil dynamics is also important, which have changed in the, without the presence of woodland. Uh, I'm going to skip past this one because Jens Christian's already shown it, but we, we know that large mammals are uh, have, We've had a big impact on large mammals and they are missing. We've really changed the system from that, that point of view. And we know they're important, again, because of the work I've done with Jens Christian's already shown, that from the, this is from beetle work in the UK, so we, we, we know that in the last interglacial that there seemed to be a higher herbivore abundance and we had a greater, uh, greater mix of open and closed woodland habitats, whereas in the early Holocene, 
when we lost these species, we're suppressing their numbers, we had higher forest cover. So in talking about community structure, I, I try to sketch out some of the from a mammal point of view, the species that we might uh, that we currently have and the ones that we uh, we could have. And we I think we get a something that looks a bit like this, uh, where the grayed out boxes are are extinct species from, from the thing from the UK. Uh, some of them I've included because we could find taxonomic substitutions for, for them. Others I've excluded because I think they're pretty much gone. We can't really find something suitable. And what we have is a, is a structure here, and the box in red in the middle is the one that's probably is, is, is as you, the, the species in blue are non-native introductions, uh, and they're not limited by a predator. So I think we have a very dominated system here by large predators. Um, so there's two, these are the, this is the area I want to talk about um, for the Scottish Highlands in particular, and that is uh, predator herbivore plant interactions and the creation of, of German ocean <coughs> niches provided by rooting and disturbance by wild boar. And the reason I've chosen these is because I happen to work on it, uh, and I also think wolf is particularly important and the one I'm going to deal with first because it's a habitat generalist. It occurs pretty much, or has occurred pretty much in all habitats in, in, uh, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, so we don't have to worry. As long as there's plenty of prey present, they seem to do all right. And uh, as I said, there's a, there's a lot of prey present in, in, in the Scottish Highlands. So they're, they're a good place to start. And also a lot of other species that are important for woodland dynamics, your boars and your beaver, often require woodland uh, to be there already. So we're hoping that maybe we, our wolf system can change the dynamics of the system, encourage a bit more woodland regeneration, which create a system that's more suitable for things like boar and beaver, which can add richness uh, to your system overall and create those disturbance dynamics. So we had a couple of key, key questions. Um, I, I, I get asked a lot, but is there really space in the UK for large predators? You know, there's, surely there's too many people. Um, and, uh, and I'm also going to take this from a fence point of view because so, so, so the social dynamics, we have, we're not in a situation of Denmark where wolves are very unlikely to, to get back to uh, Britain by themselves. Uh, they're going to need. They're going to need to be reintroduced. Um, so how do how do we change that perspective? And a fence reserve is 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 one idea that's been put forward. And then can wolves really impact uh, the, the the deer population uh, in Scotland? So um, this is where I used to work in the in the red uh, in the I don't know if this works. No. Uh, the red in the in the top corners is uh, where I used to work. So very northern tip of Scotland. This brown area in the middle is it's called the Allerdale Estate, uh, owned by a guy called Paul Lister, who's interested in creating this fence reserve idea. I used to live up here for, uh, uh, I lived up here for about five years, and I lived right in the middle of it. There's a, there's a, there's a beige circle, uh, which was my house for a couple of years. It's, it's pretty isolated, just for context. It's the, the one of the, I, I can't, show you very well, but one of the, the ne next near in ha nearest inhabited building is 10 kilometers away by, via dirt track. And you can see thousands of deer, depending on time of year and the season, between that. And I, I, I probably should include a photo, but it's what's described as a deer desert up there, because although you have a little bit of remnant woodland, you, you drive out in your 10 kilometers, and it's a beautiful countryside, and, and, and it's, it, it's you know, very popular with tourists. But at the same time, it, it, it is a system that's been entirely impoverished uh, by human activities. It's a, I used to uh, live on Glen Moor, which is a, a valley uh, that has been described a few hundred years ago, is having the finest trees, the tallest, tallest conifers in, in Scotland, which just don't exist anymore. So we want to th think about th the fact that that's getting continually smaller through hev greater and hev heavier grazing. So we tried to look at an area to see how big an area was, and we found that the 1,500 square kilometers um, is, is quite a big space, and that doesn't cut off any tarmac roads. It includes 36 buildings, most of which aren't inhabited, and that's those beige areas in the middle. And it seemed like a reasonable area that we could start talking about wolf reintroduction. Looking at the suitability, I'm gonna, just going to skip over this a little bit. Looking at suitability for wolves is all about looking at the social and the community side of it. So we know that people like to visit uh, high points, uh, the... the, the uh, uh, the Munros in Scotland, and these red areas represent those high points, wh which have a high human traffic. We don't necessarily want to put a fence up and, and create those, those problems. So, but in general, the area is not too un unsuited for, for wolves. There's a high prey density over, over this whole area. Um, so we did some modeling, um, and we wanted to work out what impact might wolves have on, on deer. And th this simply shows that setting up a variety of modeling environments um, you need to get over a threshold density of wolves to really have a strong impact on deer. 
So if we look at the bottom, we have a maximum wolf density recorded over a 100-year period on the, in our modeled environment. And until, unless you get over a density under our modeling conditions of around 80 uh, wolves per 1,000 square kilometers, you don't have an opportunity to have an impact on the deer population. Up the side, uh, on the y-axis, we have uh, minimum deer density. So it started off around 20 per square kilometers. And as you can see, as we move up to the right, it, it can reduce dramatically if the wolves get on top of it. So we talked about fenced areas, and I think the important thing is talking about fenced areas and the, and the concept we were thinking about is we have this idea of protected areas in, in Europe, or in fact most of the world. We have, we have protected areas and we have non-protected areas. And the, system, and, the, and the conditions within those areas are quite different. So what we might find in a protected area, or we might expect, is natural, natural ecosystem dynamics. But what I was worried about, what I was thinking about is uh, maybe source sink population dynamics. So if we have predators in a protected area, they're doing all right. They're getting up, up reasonably high density. But then dispersing animals that are off looking for the territories of their own and they're looking for, for mates, they're going to wonder what they think. Well, there's, not, there's pretty high density of wolves in here. Maybe this is not the best place for me to look. I'll, I'll just nip over a border that I can't see or, or interpret. And I'll, I'll go find there's, there's very few wolves over here, but there's still plenty of prey. And what you might find is they're, they're wandering off into, into areas where they are more likely to be shot or killed by people. And that, that might create that system where we have a high, we have a high number of spe uh, dispersing animals moving from within a, within a protected area to outside a protected area and reducing the maximum density you can achieve within your protected area. So we looked at this concept of boundary permeability, which is basically to say if we remove, so along the bottom here, we can remove either 0% of the, of the dispersing uh, animals or 100% of the dispersing animals. And again, we find an in, in, uh, interesting threshold. So again, if you remember the maximum wolf density is important, that's up, up the side, um, we can see that if, if the social dynamics of wolves prevent the pack density getting too high, uh, represented by the blue crosses, then we don't ever get to that density. The wolf, the wolf social, uh, social interactions prevent high wolf, de uh, high wolf density. If we allow that density to get, that pack density to get higher, um, but we, we don't have too strong, if it, we can lose up to maybe 35% of dispersing animals and not really limit the maximum density of, of, the, of the wolves. But if we start getting over that density, then we're going to have an impact on the, the maximum density of wolves and so the, the, their ability uh, to impact deer. And I think this is useful to try and set some boundaries to understand humans' impacts on the internal dynamics of predator-prey interactions. This is also important for in, in terms of um, uh, uh, time scales. Uh, this is to say how, how long does it take for a wolf to get up to uh, maximum density depending on uh, different lo losses of different numbers of dispersers. You know, and it might take 20 years or it might take quite a lot longer, 40, 50 years. So we're talking about quite a long time before we see a wolves really reducing deer population density depending on how good our model is. And we found it pretty good when comparing it to Yellowstone, but Yellowstone had quite strong impacts on the deer uh, on the elk numbers relatively quickly. But it starts, this virtual concept allows us to start thinking about these questions uh, and try and work out what the, the key issues are. So moving on to the wild boar, and I'm going to have to keep this uh, quite brief, uh, we asked a number of questions about how, wo how wild boar might interact with the Scottish environment and how that might impact the dynamics, of the habitat dynamics for, for, for woodland or vegetation community dynamics. So just quite simply, how fast, are, how, how fast are wild boar roots? How big an area do they create? How much time do they spend rooting? How does it vary from season? How does it vary between habitat? I think, that, that, so they, where does it root? And, and do trees grow in those rooted areas? I think are the key questions that we were, we were striving to answer. So we set up nine enclosures. We put different densities of boar in, and we just simply worked out how, how, and measured how much rooting area they created per week. And we found reasonably consistent um, results per week, depending on how the climate was. So between week six and seven, um, you can see the rooting rate has shot up quite dramatically. Uh, and in that week, we had very high rainfall and, and created this nice soft, soft area for them to root, and they were much more effective. And rooting has been associated with, with wet areas, so they, they, they seem to like that, that easy uh, kind of area. So we kind of get, start to get a concept of how area that might root, but this is obviously, you know, quite limited, it's quite relatively small enclosures under small densities, but getting an understanding of, of the kind of space and how they're interacting, or certainly the order of magnitude of, of their impact is, is quite important, we think. Um, in terms of uh, where do wild boar roots, um, well, this is actually, uh, we, we, we looked at a few, a few questions around this, but in terms of season, um, 
we looked at how the, the amount of foraging activity they did, and they were much more active during the autumn and winter when they were probably stressed by the cold, wet uh, thing. And I spent a, six hours a day following these boar around for quite a long time, and I can assure you it was wet and miserable and cold. Um, and I can understand why they'd want to make sure they're maximizing wh what they can eat. Um, and we also found they changed their, their foraging habits depending on season as well, as you might expect, depending on how resource, resources change. So during the autumn and winter, they spent most of their t foraging time um, uh, for foraging, uh, rooting, performing rooting behavior. So they were digging up the roots primarily of bracken uh, because the, 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 food, the food resources in, in the enclosure weren't you know, massively uh, exciting for boar. They really liked things like oak and, oak and beech mast. Be, um, but when they when they weren't given that, they're quite adaptable and they'll switch around to 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 get their uh, to get their favourite source. But then, as the grass comes through uh, during the spring, they they switch that and they they, they stop rooting so much uh, and they they switch to a more grazing behaviour. And in terms of maybe if we want to use boar in terms of naturalistic uh, uh, rooting instead of naturalistic grazing, this this could be useful in the way we deal with wild boar in farmed environments and maybe moving them out to certain woodland areas during certain times of year. And it, it's just a, another way of thinking about it. Uh, we know they have a big impact where they do root, and this is probably unsurprising. Um, and uh, looking at heather communities, uh, and what we find basically is there's a very strong dis difference. They, they create these big, big bare ground patches, uh, and, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm going to skip over because I'm pretty much out of time. But the difference, the difference is quite dramatic from rooted to unrooted areas. But obviously, the, in terms of the landscape impact, depends on the density of bore you have and the, their ability to move around. So again, it's a, it's a community type idea. So do wolves have a, a future in Scotland? Well, Allerdale, the, the Paul Lister has, has come out with renewed vig vigor to try and get wolves back in the next three years. Uh, he's going to try a few, a few different tactics, but he's going to need some big, uh, quite a big space. Um, and, but it, it, you know, there's, there's some bold ambitions out there. Um, but wolves and boar aren't the only important species. Uh, I just want to emphasize that. We need to think about all, all the dynamics. And certainly mammals aren't the only important, thing, important group to think about. We also need to think about uh, all the other communities uh, as well. So there's, there's a lot to, lot to get our, our teeth into. And I also want to think about what, what, what do we do about the species that we aren't likely to reintroduce anytime soon because they deliver important processes. And this might be a problem for 100 years' time when woodland is expanding all over Scotland and becoming the new, the new, the new pest. Um, and we might want to think about some elephants back in, then. So I just want to say thank you very much to uh, all my co-authors and people who funded me uh, and you for listening as well. Thanks very much. I think thank I'm out of time. But. No, it's nice. It's no. nice. Okay. You, you, you. Uh, thank you to Chris for, for uh, keeping inside the schedule. Uh, we have a couple of minutes okay. uh, of uh, comments and questions. And please, if you have anything to ask, uh, Chris, please uh, uh, give, uh, tell us who you are and where you come from. Anybody, any comments, any questions? Yep. My name is Sam, and I'm from... And you have to yell, uh, to yell, um, Michel. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that the wild wood have a, a huge impact, but what sort of impact? Positive or negative with the biodiversity? Oh, yeah, so I was a bit rushed by that point. I, I, I think positive and negative is a very different, difficult concept to deal with because if you take a wild boar population without any predators, when you've got all sorts of extra food sources through waste and their population expands to, to very large, uh, large densities, especially after a, a good seed year, and there's, um, what you will find is that at that density they'll have a really big impact kind of everywhere, and they'll start rooting up golf courses and football pitches and people's gardens, and that will be seen as a very negative impact. If you put them in a, a system which is, has, has a community uh, that's very intact, you've got a big space and you've got natural processes, they'll disturb some areas and they'll leave other areas, and what you'll find is a positive biodiversity impact at the wider scale. So what we found was on, on a very site-based area, if the boar come in and root an area, obviously you lose all the vegetation, so you're just getting less biodiversity. You, they, they've rooted up and created bare ground. But what you find is a different community coming back afterwards, which is going to have, just providing that different opportunity and, and, and it's, it's going to provide a positive impact. So it depends on how you look at it. Any more questions or comments? Yes? And um, from um, how many rewarding projects are existing in Scotland or in the UK? Is it many or 
I, I think there's quite a few, and uh, not all of them are talked about as rewilding projects, but they're taking rewilding type ideas. Um, I, I'm involved with a group at the moment that's asking that exact question because no one has an exact answer, so we might do that research. But there are quite a few sites, and there are quite a big landowners who are interested in the idea of rewilding. And the advantage of Scotland is you can buy big, big areas of land uh, relatively cheaply for these guys. Uh, for, for most of us, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.